let's open up in prayer. Father, we praise you and thank you for this time. Lord, we pray that you'd bless this class, bless our thoughts as we dig into your word and really uh, uh, ask some penetrating questions of ourselves and that you would be speaking to our hearts as we do. Uh, we'll give you glory for a great class. We, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Lesson 10. So I was saying, lesson 10, we've got today, we've got two more classes, and then we finish. Um, and the last two classes are kind of um, crucial classes because uh, I'm going to basically deal with, so now what? Um, I'm going to deal with, uh, uh, we've talked about finding uh, a nugget, uh, finding around the nugget our deposits of truth, picking out a vein, following that vein of truth until we find a place where we want to dig deep and we drive a shaft and we're using our tools for that and then we have a bunch of shafts so we have an entire mine system. Um, one of the things that I've been asked often is, so, so then what? After you get a lot of stuff, um, besides the Bible, how do you control it? And we're going to talk about that uh, in the next two weeks. Uh, and and uh, so don't miss the next two weeks if you can. Um, we're in Lesson 10, page 79, uh, entitled Sharing the Wealth. Now, we talked about sharing last week. And... Uh, the, the idea was to go out and share with, uh, with somebody something you've learned from the class. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about sharing today, and what we're, going to do, we're going to do the first chapter of Titus together uh, with the questions that I have in there. Then I've given you, in your, in your workbook, I've given you the entire book of Titus with the kinds of questions that you could be asking yourself. And these questions are, are questions that are designed to take us to application. The who, what, when, where, why, uh, the who, what, when, where is really informational, digging to find information about, like we did last week with who is Titus, uh, where is he, what, how old is he, all those sorts of things. The why question is one that takes you into deep application. We've touched on it over and over again where I'll say, uh, why is this important to me? Uh, can I say that? Uh, I do that. I, I was in a Bible study this morning in Psalms, and I wrote in my Bible, can I say that? Um, right in the margins. And so that is where you really get the ammunition for sharing that's not teaching. It's, it's sharing is, let me tell you something that, has applied, that I saw, a little, this cool truth that I saw that has really meant something to me. Now, if you share it from, let me show you something I discovered, and, it's, and you, there's no element of what it means to you, it sounds preachy. It sounds teachy. Um, it sounds like you're... You could even be uh, pointing at, boy, do you need this? <laughs> you know, the, that kind of sharing. Um, but if you share it from, I saw something that just impacted me. Let me tell you about what it means to me, and you're sharing that. Now it's not teaching, it's not preaching, it's literally sharing. And your application question of why and am I and those kind of questions of application will help you so much in the sharing process. And that's what we really want to talk about today. We're going to do a Bible study uh, in Titus uh, asking questions, but a lot of the questions as we go, you'll see a lot of the questions are, so what or why does that make any difference to me? And if I can, if the Holy Spirit can make an impact in why that makes a difference to me, I can share that and and it becomes something that is uh, what we used to call a transferable concept because now I've got something that has impacted me that I'm sharing with something somebody that can impact them. All right, so Titus. Now, last week, we, if we started Bible study in Titus, last week we spent the whole time on background, asking the who, what, why, who, what, when, where questions. Uh, background questions, 
the, as we go now, we'll know who's talking, who's, who's he talking to, and what they're, what they're like. So on page 79, right in the middle, Titus, can you dig it? Let's dig a little bit into Titus. I'm going to go to our first Titus right here, and I'm going to come up to the top, and uh, I'm going to start. Now, you notice my bracket here on this page. Um, the bracket from verse 1 to verse 4 is the salutation. Now, a lot of us, when we read a salutation, Paul, a bondservant to, to Titus, and all this, we have a tendency to just go, okay, he's just saying hello, we go past this. I make a point here, do not skip the salutation, because the salutation often gives you a theme of why he's writing the book. And it'll give you often a theme, and we're going to see that here as we go through the salutation, of what his agenda is in writing the book as part of the salutation. Uh, so uh, we'll, we're going to go into the salutation. Okay, so first word, Paul. We talked about Paul. We did that last week, who Paul is. Where is Paul when he's writing this letter? You remember from last week? Where is he? He's in jail, and he's in jail in Rome for the second time. This is the last time. Uh, this and, ti and the letter to Timothy are the last letters he's going to write to anybody. So he is, the first time he goes to Rome and he's arrested, he's arrested as a Roman citizen. He's under house arrest. Uh, he, he, he's living in a home. Um, he's under arrest, but like he can't just walk around, but... He's not, um, he's not under, he's not in a cell. This time, he's in a cell locked to a soldier, uh, which was okay with him because he won a bunch of soldiers in the Praetorian Guard to Christ during this period. But this time, he really is in jail, and it's not a pleasant situation. Uh, and he's writing to his young uh, friend, Titus, we're going to see that. So, Paul, we saw that, okay? Now, he describes himself, I wrote a note here, if you look up here, you see this note. He describes himself as a servant. How would I describe myself? You see, I've written an application question for myself. Paul's saying, I am a bond servant. So, the first thing I did was, wait a minute now, Paul is saying, I'm a bond servant. Can I say that am I am I a bond servant of Christ? Can I really say that? Well, to answer my own question, what's the next thing I have to do? If I say, Am I a bond servant of Christ? Uh, well, what's a bond servant of Christ? What does that mean? So I did a little research. Okay? So I'm into the second, the third word, Paul A bond servant. And I'm stopping. And I'm gonna, I found this little nugget of bond servant, but now I need to do a little digging right there. So I'm going to get my tools out, and I'm going to do some checking on bond servant. Somebody look up, and if you could see right here in my, in my treasure map, I wrote Deuteronomy 15, 16, and 17. Somebody that has tabs can go, boop. Oh, okay, never mind. I keep running it. Okay, Deuteronomy 15, 16, and 17. You have it? Go ahead. It shall come about if he says to you, I will not go out from you because he loves you in your house, since he fares well with you. Then, shake, then you shall take an awl and pierce it through his ear into the door, and it shall be your servant forever. Also you shall do likewise to your maid servant. Okay, now the context of this is... The, the the Jews had a year of jubilee where they gave they basically released their slaves. The every debts were paid off and everything else, and so it's saying if you go to your slave and you say you're free, and the slave says, but you know I I, I love you and your family. I, I I enjoy working for you. I enjoy being your slave. Uh, I love you. I love your kids. This is what it says, and I want to stay your slave. And then the instructions are, okay, take an awl. Anybody ever worked with an awl? 
It's like a leather punch. It's a, it's a punch. It's not a little needle. It's, uh, it's, it's a pretty good sized uh, hole. And you put him up against the door, and you take the awl, and you pound it through his ear, and he, got, he has this hole, and then you put an earring through it. He didn't talk about that, but they wore, wore, wore a gold earring. So if you were walking along the street and you see a person that's got a single gold earring, that would say, ah, this person is a bond servant. Okay? So a bond servant, I wrote right here, based upon Deuteronomy 15, 16, and 17, that starts this whole idea of bond servants. A bond servant is a slave by choice because of love. Now I can ask myself the question. Right? Am I a bond servant? Am I a slave by choice because I love the Lord? Now, a slave has no rights. I got nothing to make demands on the Lord if I'm a bond servant. If I'm a slave, I'm a slave by choice. The master tells me what he wants me to do every day. The master tells me what he wants me to accomplish. The master tells me. All I do is say, I'm your slave because I love you. Now that becomes an interesting question to myself. Am I a bond servant of Christ? Or am I a demanding, spoiled brat that prays, I want it my way? That's not a slave. Slaves don't demand anything, right? You see where that can go? So you could, you could stop there at bondservant and really, now I need to go and study about obedience. I need to go study, maybe further study on slave. Uh, so that can... That can take you, take you deep. So you could share with somebody. Man, I was, do, I was reading in, in Titus, Paul calls himself a bond servant. I did some research on a bond servant. And, you know, I was thinking about, and I literally I was sharing this the other day in my small group, I literally was thinking about getting an earring. Uh, a lot of my jewelry means things. It, it has verses and I can, I can share the gospel using my jewelry. And one of the things I've, I've considered is getting a single earring and having somebody say, well, what, you know, what's the deal with your earring? And I could explain. That, what a great way to share the gospel with somebody. You know, what's, what's, I like your earring. What's the deal? You going to get with an or, though? Or what was an all? What was it? Yeah. No, I'd probably, I'd probably do it with a little machine. But anyway. Yeah. But, but, uh, but. I, I wrote a blog one time that said um, Paul and Peter probably wore an earring uh, because they were B Paul, Peter, James, uh, and Jude all call themselves bond servants of Christ. All of them, even a half brother of Jesus, he never said I'm a half brother of Jesus. He said I'm a bond servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, so that, you know that I could share that with somebody about. You know, I, I quit complaining about my rights when I turn my life over to Christ and I'm his servant because I love him. Okay? You see where that can take you? Okay? So you could go deep there. You could do you could do on servant or bond servant, you could go do cross references and find out. Peter, James, uh, John, I think, calls himself a bond servant. It's, it's a very common thing for the apostles and the first century believers to call themselves bond servants. And how many of us as believers today have that concept that it's not about my rights, it's about the one I serve. I'm a, I'm a slave. Um, okay. So then I go on. How he describes himself. And you can see in my notes down there, these are questions. So how does he describe himself? What is a bond servant? Are you one? Am I one? Um, there's, uh, there's another reference I'll give you, Exodus 21, 5 and 6. Exodus 21, 5 and 6 is another where they're talking about a voluntary servant because of love, and they become bond servants. Then he goes on. Let's go back to Titus. A bond servant of God and an apostle. Okay, stop the presses. What, have I, 
what do I have to ask myself? What's an apostle? Now, we all think we know. So what's an apostle? Isn't it someone called by Jesus Christ himself? Okay. There are, if you go and do a lot of digging, there are two apostles mentioned, two kinds. One is, I, I make the distinction, a capital A apostle, the apostles, which are the 12, okay? That's the capital A apostle. But that term, apostle, is used by a lot of other people in the, first, in the, in the New Testament. And other people are referred to as, he's your apostle, okay? So if, let's make the distinction with a capital A would be an apostle who's called personally by Jesus Christ. When you see Peter in the book of Acts saying, we need to, you know, uh, Judas is gone, we need another guy, and he gives the description of, he, he's got to be qualified, he's got to be personally called by Jesus Christ to be the deal. And they, they throw lots and they choose the wrong guy. Because if they would have been patient, Jesus personally calls Paul to be the apostle. That's why Paul says, I am an apostle lately called. I was lately called uh, by Christ. So, an apostle, this is, this is, Paul is saying, I'm an apostle. We could take it either way. But it also just means, if we look at the small a, it just means a sent one. It, it just means, I've been sent by somebody with a message. So I'm, I'm, the, I'm the apostle to you, guys. I've been sent with a message about Bible study to you. I'm a small a apostle, okay? Very humble, small a, okay? And then he makes it clear, I, I am a sent one. I put down here in my notes, a messenger sent by another. And then he clarifies, I'm an apostle of who? Of Jesus Christ. I'm a sent one sent by him. I'm not sent by Peter. I'm not sent by the church in Antioch. I'm sent by Jesus Christ. Now that's good for me if I'm going to go into mission work. Uh, the mission board didn't send me to my field. Jesus Christ sent me. If I'm there for the mission board, or if I'm there for the church, I'm there for the wrong reasons. I need to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, not an apostle of the Baptist Convention. Nothing wrong with the Baptist Convention, but you see what I'm saying? So I just, well, that's, there's a very interesting thing here. Why am I involved in my church? Why, why am I teaching this class for the 11th time, okay? Uh, 12 weeks plus weeks off for rain and everything else. Mm -hmm. uh, be, because I serve him. I'm his bond servant. And as a slave, he has sent me to all y'all. That's plural Hebrew, all y'all. Okay, <laughs> but you see where we're going? So I, the meditation is, under at the bottom of page 79 is, how would you describe yourself? It, he, Paul is describing himself this way. How would you describe yourself? Uh, what are some of the key words in his description? Now, because it goes on. Now, remember what I said earlier in another class about lists. Okay? Lists are wonderful. Lists will take you deep, deep, deep if you watch for lists. And there's a list here. He says, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ for the faith of those chosen of God. So I'm, I'm sent to a group of people. I'm sent to believers for those who are chosen of God. And the knowledge of the truth, as, so it's the way it's done is, I'm an apostle for the faith of those chosen of God and an apostle for the knowledge of the truth, which is according to godliness in the hope. And then he goes, he's typical Paul, he goes off on a little rabbit trail. He starts talking about godliness according to godliness. But look at the list. Look at these words. At the bottom of page 79, I gave you a list of words, didn't I? Okay? You get, in his description of himself, in his salutation, he starts words, using some words. Knowledge, truth, godliness, hope, eternal life, 
promised. Look, you can just read right along. Um, manifested. His word. Okay? Proclamation. There it is right there in verse 3. Um, uh, entrusted. And commandment. Now, take out your little trusty Web Webster's and your Bible dictionary and your maybe a, a, a concordance to do some checking and cross-referencing. How many hours could you spend on that list? You see? Now, you don't necessarily do that. As you're reading the list and thinking about them, Okay? One might really jump out at you. That's the one that you want to start to dig. The, the one that the Holy Spirit just kind of speaks to you. Uh, may, maybe I'm going along and, they, you know, this idea of uh, knowledge of the truth. Okay? Well, one of the things I know about Paul, when he writes to Timothy and to Titus, he talks about true doctrine. That's one of his themes. So I might stop and do a whole study on truth. I might find out in John that says, obey me and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So it's interesting. Paul is saying he's a servant, a slave, but he's free because of the truth. Um, so I might do some digging. Now I could also stop and literally dig for every one of those terms and that would be perfectly fine Bible study. But you don't have to. You could say, oh, that's an inter interesting list. You might even write down a note to yourself. Come back and do a, do a word study on knowledge. Do a word, word study. Manifested is a cool word for me. Um, uh, manifested. It's, it's uh, uh, we were talking to uh, Jason, who was a truck driver, a tr you know, a trucking company. Every truck, every ship that, that travels has a manifest of everything that's contained inside that truck or inside that ship. It's a list of the contents. Jesus Christ came to manifest God to us. We look at Jesus when he said to Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He's basically saying, I'm here to manifest the Father to you. If you look at me, you see all the contents that are in God. That's cool. That you could go deep there. Everybody with me? And it's totally up to you what you want to do, but there's where you might come across a nugget in proclaim. Um, what does that mean? Um, you read this. Um, Chosen and the knowledge of the truth, which is according to godliness. First Timothy 2, 2, I did a little study on godliness. Great. Uh, in the hope, uh, and then I wrote over here, you might see my note, that does not mean hope as in we use it today, uh, hope as in cross our fingers and hope. It means confidence. It's in the confidence of eternal life. So do I have confidence? I know so many believers, even at this church, who struggle with eternal security. Am I a Christian today? If I blow it, am I a Christian tonight? Uh, I'm not, I don't feel like a Christian. I don't, I don't feel like I'm saved. And we struggle with that. We're supposed to have a confidence. Um, a confidence of eternal life based upon God's promise, because he cannot lie. He made long ago, he says that. And at the proper time manifested even his word in the proclamation which I was entrusted according to the commandment of God, our Savior. And I'm writing to Titus, my true child. Okay, so you can go on. And a common faith. So I write, if we go on to the next page, at the top I say, Titus, we know a lot about Titus. What is a true child? He says in verse 4, to, to Titus, my true child. Now look over at 1 Timothy chapter two or chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. See that I wrote that right here? I wrote this wonderful little line. And this very clear little 1 Timothy 1, 2, and 3. Somebody have that? Timothy, my true child in the faith. See? Paul used it again. I don't mean to interrupt you, John, but that's true. See that? True child. So that's there's a cross-reference there. Paul calls his men 
a true child. Now, a lot of people speculate when he says true child, true child, that he specifically, personally had something to do with them coming to the Lord. That's speculation. Uh, we don't know for sure. But this idea of true child in the theme of Paul and his thing on truth and tr true doctrine a true child is somebody that has become a believer based upon truth. So what's a question? What's a question you can ask yourself? Am I a true child? And do I have any? Paul is writing and calling a young guy my true child. So one of the questions I asked myself was, do I have a true child? Am I about the work of getting true children? See what I'm saying? Now, that can be very convicting. I, gee, I don't, I've never led anybody to Christ. Well, maybe it's time I learned how. That might take me there. Uh, I am a true child. Well, 2 Timothy 2.2 says I'm supposed to be telling other people so that they can tell other people they... So how come I'm not making a true child? I don't know how. Okay, I need to go help. I need to go get somebody's help on how do you make a true child. And I could get that out of this verse just from the Holy Spirit speaking to me, asking myself the question, am I a true child? You follow what I'm saying? That's where application comes with asking our questions, going deep, and then asking the question, is it, is it about me? I mean, does that apply to me? Or does it apply to my life? Do, do I have one? Do I, have I ever had one? What a shame to, to, for somebody to be a Christian years and never have led anybody to Christ. Uh, I might really get convicted to take an action to learn how to do some things from, just from that term. See, just by asking the question, and making the application questions. Why does that matter? Am I, am I a bond servant of Christ that I should be making true children? In a common faith, common is good because I'm making a true child in the same faith that I have. We have a common a unity. You can go and do a word study on unity. It can take you some cool places. Then it comes down here. Uh, Titus, my true child, and com we're still in the salutation, by the way. Now, we have probably spent, if we're really studying, we, we could have spent three or four hours, maybe a couple of sessions, on the first three verse verses. That's Bible study, not, not whizzing through at 80 miles an hour. Okay? Um, so it comes down in a common faith, and then he says to, to him, there's a pause, to Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace. Now you could stop and do a cool study and see how many times Paul uses the term grace and peace. Almost every single letter he writes to anybody, he says grace and peace, either at the beginning or at the end of the book, and sometimes both. He also always, I think Tony said this just uh, maybe last Sunday or the Sunday, maybe Easter Sunday or the Sunday before, I can't remember. It is always grace and peace. It is never peace and grace. So if I ask the question, what's grace? He says, grace and peace. Now, a lot of us Christians are really interested in having peace in our life. So we need to do a little questioning. If I want peace... How am I handling grace? What is grace? Um, and we could ask ourselves a question. And go to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace you've been saved through Christ. It is a free gift. So grace is something you're given for free. But it's interesting here. He says, grace and peace. So where does grace come from? Let's not, let's not even talk about what it is. Let's, let's say we assume we, we know what it is. Where does it come from? Okay? Because he says right there, from God the Father and Christ Jesus, right? Okay? So God gives it, 
Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace you've been saved through Christ. It is a free gift of God. Right? That no one should boast. If you look at peace, John 14, 27 says, Jesus says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives. Okay? So where do we get peace? From Jesus. We get grace from the Father through Christ. We get peace from Christ based upon what the Father has given. Okay? So he says that. My true child, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. And he just got done saying God our Savior up here, which is a different... We talked about that last week. But here, so in something you've read a million times as a Christian, this little phrase where Paul will say, to Timothy, uh, my, my child in the, in the faith, to Titus, my true child in, in common faith, uh, grace and peace. And we, a million times. But you stop and you start asking yourself the question, do I have grace? Have I been given grace? And do I feel that I have somehow lost that grace that I was given? Is, is, is salvation grace different than the grace I need to live today? You see where you can ask some questions, and now you've got to go find the answers. And will that take you deep? Yes, it will. And you can ask yourself the question, wait a minute, do I have peace? You know, I've talked about my... My, before I was a Christian, I was, I was uh, angry. I was murderous. Um, I could kill you and not hesitate. Did it, almost did it once and would have done it another time to my own father. Would have done it. No problem at all. The big thing that I have in my testimony of what Christ did for my life when I turned over my life to him is he took me from anger, and the Hebrew word for anger is heat. It's a burning, and he gave me a peace. I use that in Hawaii. My, my testimony is uh, I was like uh, pohoihoi. It's a type of lava that looks like black tar, but you scratch it, and it's 2,000 degrees inside. It'll burn you. I think I gave that testimony to you guys. Uh, but when that lava gets to the ocean... And, and spills into the ocean at 2,000 degrees, that cold Pacific water cools that down and, and turns it into rock. And I could take being surrounded by the Holy Spirit, being submerged in the Holy Spirit as a brand new Christian, God brought about a cooling in my life. He cooled my anger. He cooled the heat of my resentment and, and envy and uh, frustration at life and he gave me a peace. Okay? Now, from that, I, I can share that with somebody. Uh, peace. And you could, so you can go and do what peace is. And do you have it? Everybody with me? Peace basically, by the way, uh, if you're curious, if you do a long study, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse, uh, I think it's 17, talks about peace being a quietness because of what's inside. Uh, he said, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. And the word, the, Hebrew, the Greek word for quiet is at peace because of what's inside. Um, so that's cool. So I could stop and do a whole study on peace. I could do a whole study on grace. I could do, a, you see what I'm saying? You could stop and do a study on any of these words and go deep. Um, Everybody with me? You guys are just like, okay. <laughs> Hard to read. Okay. Now, we just spent some time, and we could, we could have spent, um, I, we could, I could teach a Bible study with y'all, and we could probably spend three sessions, maybe four sessions, on the first four verses. Easily. If I'm going to do an in-depth Bible study. Uh, you could do it in an hour. You could do it in 10 hours. It depends upon how deep you want to go using your tools to go deep on the words that really impact you. Okay? 
application. So a meditation might be, do you have grace and peace in your life? Why and why not? If I say, yes, I do. Why do I have it? Now, I might share that with somebody saying, I was reading this verse. He was talking about grace and peace. I always notice that grace always comes first. And grace is getting what we don't deserve. And boy, I don't deserve this life. I don't deserve. See, I can be telling a waitress this. I can be sharing. That's not preaching. There's no, typically there is no resentment when you do that. And I'll be reading my Bible at, at City Cafe, it just happened the other day. And a waitress who I didn't know walked up and said, what are you studying? Well, I, uh, I forget what it was, but I said, I'm, I'm doing a word study on grace. Just the grace we have in Jesus. And, she, you know, she immediately says, yeah, boy, it's, it's been great that that's in my life since I accepted him. You know, wow. Okay, we'll, we'll talk more about that another week. Okay, application. Is Christ Jesus your Savior? Is he your Lord? Do you need to talk to a spiritual leader about something? I have met, have had guys from this church, uh, there's nobody in here, well, Darnell's one, that calls me and says, can we get together for coffee? And I say, sure. And one of the first things I do, I don't care if he's been to this church for 10 years, the first thing I do is I want to know about how you met Jesus. If you can't tell me how you met Jesus and what he means to you, you're probably not a Christian. And I'll get, tell me about your relationship with Christ. Well, I've been coming to this church for 10 years. <laughs> and, I'll have, and I'll have guys get offended. What do you mean? I said, well, tell me, uh, how, how, is, uh, how is your life about peace and joy? Well, I'm really strong. I don't have any peace. I don't have any joy. We had a similar conversation to this, didn't we, when you and I met. I do it with everybody. And every so often, I'll get a guy. Well, not every so often. Out of the last five guys I've met with, uh, twice. Twice. Well, I'm doing it with guys, and they can tell me, and that's great. So now, now we can fellowship based upon I know where they're at. But there's a lot of guys who are environmental Christians. Uh, who say they're Christian because they go to church. That's like a roller skate saying it's a car because it's in a garage. It's not. we got to get to the issue. Do you have the peace of Christ? Have you experienced the grace of Christ? If you don't, even if you say, well, I went down when I was three years old, I got baptized when I was five years old, and I don't know, I, I haven't been... Look, Let's reaffirm that right now. Let's nail it down. I'll write in your Bible that I'm a witness of this prayer. And the next time you're questioning whether you're a Christian or not, you can go to the front of your Bible and say that Len Allen witnessed you rededicating your life to Christ. At the post in the ground, we're settled. I do that. Everybody I meet with. Uh, and every so often I run into an environmental Christian. So that application. Then the next, qu the next thing, if you look... Going in, we are we are going to finish the first chapter. <laughs> One time, I told my son he was sitting in a Bible study. I said, "Next next week we're going to do the second chapter of First John," and he literally went, <laughs> "Shut up, little brat." Um, I hope you're watching this video. Uh, <laughs> okay, yeah, you see the bracket I put on the notes from verse five to verse 9, is qualities of church leaders. Now, he goes into that because verse 5 says, for this reason, because I'm a bondservant, and because you're my true child, and because I'm, uh, I've got the grace and peace, okay, to you, Titus, for, for this reason, I left you in Crete. And then he goes, the reason is, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders. He's got two jobs. One is he's got to organize the churches in Crete. And if you go to a map, 
creates this big island. Uh, he's got to organize the churches, set in order what remains, and appoint elders in every city as I directed. They didn't have elder elections. The, the bishop, Titus, Paul, Timothy, whatever, appointed guys to be elders. So if God is, if, if I'm Paul and I'm telling Don, Don, appoint elders, what's a question Don's going to have? Well, what's an elder? And what are the qualifications to be one that I'm looking for? If I got to go uh, find some. And that's exactly what he does, you see? So I've put on here qualities of leadership, qualities of leaders. Um, and they go, um, appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Namely, if any man is, and then there's a list. So if you go through, go to the next uh, bottom of the page, Titus's two-fold job, bottom of page uh, 80, his two-fold job is he's organizing and he's appointing elders, leadership. So if you're, if you're coming in as a church planter, you're organizing the church, but you're also looking for people in the church that you can appoint as leaders. And ultimately, you might want to back out and go to another church if you're called to be a church planter, not a pastor. Um, so then he gives a list, another list. You see where we can go? Now, on the top of page 81, I gave you the list. Now, your trusty Webster's Dictionary. Have you got it there in page 81? So you can do what we've done in past deals. Get out your little Webster's Dictionary. Say, what does dissipation mean? You find out it's, it's a, a process of slowly disappearing or becoming less. So if a guy is giving himself to dissipation, his behavior is such that lessens him and lessens him and lessens him. That's dissipation. You want to look at dissipation? You look at somebody who tries meth and is hooked on meth and come back to him a year later, you will see dissipation. He will disappear into a giant scab. I mean, that's dissipation. I think of that when I think of that word. Self-willed. Okay? Now here's Here's the deal. I took this list. Come right up here. Um, um, husband of one wife, children, verse 6. Verse 7. For the overseer, if you look at the word little number 1 over there, you come down here, bishop, okay? Bishop, elder, shepherd, they're all in leadership of the church. Must be above reproach as God's steward. So I could ask myself, wait a minute. What's the question there? What's a steward? And am I God's steward in my life? You know, can, can that be an application for you? <laughs> A steward. Uh, it's not fancy. It means financial control. So am I a steward for God? Wow. But here's the word that got me, self-willed. Now, I'm reading this list, and... I could stop and do every word, but I probably didn't. Not until another time, another place. But I'm reading along, and all of a sudden, self-willed came out to me. Because that was me. Um, so I started to do some research, and I wrote a little line. See this little wonderful little line? It goes over here. And I wrote a note. And I did. This is a vein. You see the verses? It, it basically means self-willed means arrogant. It's, it's my will that counts here. That's an arrogance. And so I did a whole study, Old Testament and New Testament, on self-willed, on being arrogant. Um, and there they are. And they could go and... So I'm doing a Bible study with this note come self will what does self will mean somebody goes ah, it means you know stubborn it means anything i say okay uh why don't you, you turn to nehemiah 9 16 you turn to second chronicles 36 
You know, you sound like you're a genius, but you just got them in your treasure map, that's all. And you take them to some pretty cool treasure because you've done this vein and you've just, you may have done, used a, uh, a uh, concordance, you may have used anything uh, for a tool. Um, so I did that. Uh, not quick tempered. That was one I also did a study on because um, <laughs> boy was I quick tempered. Um, I shot that kid right between the eyes. Probably that whole episode took five minutes, and I sh I could have killed him. I wanted to kill him. Um, I don't. That's, that sounds terrible, honey. I'm, I'm much nicer now. I haven't tried to kill anybody. What time is it? No, I'm teasing. Okay, but not not quick tempered. So I got to ask myself a question: What does that mean? And then the application is, well, what about me? Okay. Now, I also might know somebody who's got a real issue with this. And I say, I need to share that with him. Now, if I just come right at him, boy, did I find a verse for you. Boom. That's preachy. That's, that's going to get pushed back. But if I can do a study on that deep enough that there's an application in my life and say, without saying, boy, you got a problem with this, I can say, you know, I was reading something the other day. The Holy Spirit really spoke to me about being quick-tempered and that flash point. And I've really been convicted that I need to not be that with my kids, not quick-tempered, or not be that with my wife or my, my people at my work or whatever, that, that quick flash thing. And I'm sharing from my heart, and my prayer underneath that is for the Holy Spirit to take my application and I'm sharing it with somebody that he might move. And that's not preaching. That's sharing. Okay? And it takes a lot of pressure off you because you're literally sharing something God's done in your life, sharing the treasure. And you're not saying, and you need to, you know, you're not doing that. You're just sharing something that's cool. Let the Holy Spirit be the one that convicts. Okay? That... To, does that feel different than maybe you've tried to do in the past? Uh, it, it works with kids. Instead of being the... One thing kids are good at is sniffing out hypocrisy. Take care of your body. Eat what's good for you as you're puffing your cigarette. They see through that in a heartbeat. Say, well, if you do that, why should I have to do this? Um, but if you start sharing with you... you know. I saw something really cool the other day, son. But I used to be really quick-tempered, and I I don't want to be with you. I don't I don't want to be that because this is what this verse says. And now he's saying, "Wow, this is not him lecturing me. This is him being a real person, sharing about what God is doing in his life. Maybe God can do things in my life." Okay, all right. There's a, this big list. Hosp Hospitable is one of the words down here, right here, verse 8, but hospitable. You go, what? No, hospitable. So you say, okay, what does hospitable mean? What do we, what do we think of when we say hospitality? Come over for dinner, cup of coffee, you know, come over, right? That's not what the word hospitality means. Okay. You look at the word. Okay, hospital. Okay, so what the Greek word means is to is uh, having an environment. In fact, the, what the word means is having an environment where plants, animals, and people can live and grow. Now, if we take that to this, he's not talking about guys that are good planters here you know, with plants. He's talking about a place, a person that can, can meet with somebody and create an environment that encourages other people to thrive and grow and be comfortable. Like at a hospital. That's where we get the word hospital. It's not throwing a party, it's creating an environment of comfort, an environment of encouragement. 
So if I want to meet with a young guy that I'm discipling, one of the things in the back of my mind is I want to create a hospital environment for him. I want to create a place where he can nurture, feel comfortable, grow, be safe, maybe be cured. You see where we could go with these, this list? Um, uh, th then you could go at the bottom of page or the middle of page uh, 81, compare these qualities with a list of 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, which Paul writes to Timothy about choosing elders. And then you go, then the, another question, if you do the comparison, make a list, in, in 1 Timothy there's, it's about 15 things. And you go, wh why aren't the lists exactly the same? You ask yourself the question. There's a list here of elders, and there's a list here of elders. Why aren't they exactly the same? Why would you think? Why would you think? Different towns, different struggles. Okay. Maybe different towns, okay. But also, I think the same thing is with, you, you run into the same thing with spiritual gifts. If you look up spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 12, and for spiritual gifts in Romans 12, they're not the same list. And what you could take from that is neither list is meant to be exhaustive. These are not meant to be this hardcore, you know, put this in a rock and this is what they've got to be. This is the kind of people that need to be elders. These are issues uh, that need to be elders. And he's making the list once for Timothy and another time for Titus, and he's, he's not trying to, be, to say, okay, I got this list of, of 18 things that have to be, like if I listed doctrine, there are nine doctrines that are set. He's basically saying, these are the kinds of things a man that's an elder should be. Neither is meant to be exhaustive. So I could take both lists, combine them. I could take references from those lists and say, this is the kind of guy we're looking for. Even the kind of woman we're looking for. Okay? Now, uh, what is reproach? He goes, he goes on. Okay? In the end of verse is, uh, after he's done with the list, one of the last things is, they've got to be holding fast to the faithful word. So you can ask yourself the question, am I holding fast to the faithful word? That's what this class is about, anyway. Uh, the holding fast to the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching. The, what teaching? He well, he's, explains that so that he will be able to both to exhort in sound doctrine and refute. And the way the Greek is, it's exhort in sound doctrine and refute and refute in sound doctrine. Those who contradict sound doctrine. So, you could ask, am I ready to refute? People that are not teaching, that contradict sound doctrine? Do I know what sound doctrine is? Maybe I need to go and do a Bible study of the nine, what's the, doctor, what's the doctrine of God? What's the doctrine of the Holy Spirit? What's the doctrine of Jesus Christ? What's the doctrine of man? What's the doctrine of salvation? What's the doctrine of angels? What's the doctrine of, um, of um, yeah, that's, what's the doctrine of sin? Um, uh, and the doctrine of end times. Those are the nine major doctrines of the scripture, of the faith. So I could stop and say, okay, I need to stop doing Titus here, and I need to go off and do a study of what are the sound doc what is sound doctrine, and do a do a study. First Timothy mentions it seven or eight times. Titus is going to mention it a number of times. Sound doctrine, and to refute. What does refute mean? So you get on there. Um, and then he goes down here and says, uh, the next section, I'm going to back up a little bit. The next section from verse 10. Now you notice on my notes, I just want to show you this little trick. I, I know there's more here because you see my bracket. I come down here and there's my bracket with the heading qualities of false teachers. I've just done qualities of leaders. Now I'm doing qualities of false teachers here. But you see how I go like this and then off and there's an arrow? That just automatically tells me that bracket continues on the next page. That's all that tells me. 
But I, I know that automatically because of this arrow. If there was a bracket that stopped right here that, that, that pulled in, I'd know just, just those pages. So I would go to the next page and say, if I was teaching it, I'd go in here and say, okay, that bracket, see, there's the arrow, it picks up off of 13, it goes all the way down to 16. So I could go back here and say, okay, this section goes from verse 10 to verse 16, and it's all about the qualities of false teachers. Now, I might see something in there that um, speaks to me. I won't go over that, but there's another list. Now, you can compare this list, the qualities, let's pull in here. There are many rebellious men, rebellious, empty talkers, deceivers, um, especially those of the circumcision, those are Judaizers, I made a note right here. Uh, the legalistic life. If you know somebody that's leading a real legalistic life, that's as close as Judaizers we got in the church today. Somebody that's just legalistic. Okay? Um, and I go see verse, verse uh, right here. Legalistic, see verse 14. Somebody read verse 14 real quick instead of me jumping there. Not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. Okay. Commands of people, or comm commands of tradition, or commands of men is what the New American Standard says. A lot of legalistic people are not talking about what the Scripture says. They're talking about their rules that they make up. Okay? So I wrote a letter here, I wrote a note here. Uh, those are the circumcision, Judaizers, legalistic lifestyle, see this, verse 14. And then I came down here, and I wrote, they need to get grace and obey the law to be justified. That's what they say. To, to get grace, you've got to obey the law. That's Seventh-day Adventism, by the way. Okay? Uh, plus some other doctrines there that they have a problem with. Um, but we don't get grace by obeying the law to be justified. What did he just say up in the salutation? Grace and peace from the Lord, free. Uh, okay. So you can see uh, what I'm what I'm trying to do here and give you is you got in page 60, uh, 82, Titus one through uh, ten through sixteen is the quality of non-believers. Believers, how are non-believers described in verse ten? You can see them: rebellious men, empty talkers, deceivers. Um. Now, forget the especially those, because that, those, that's an additional thing. He said, here's the non-believer. They're rebellious men, empty talkers, and deceivers. Um, that really describes a non-believer. That describes me before I was a non-believer. I mean, before I was a Christian. Um, you could go, you could go, what, rebellion. You could find great verses about Rebelling from God is the definition of sin. Empty talkers. Um, and then I wrote a line down here. Empty talkers, and then he wrote down, one of themselves, a prophet of their own. And this is not a prophet of God. This is like, he's a prophet in his own mind, right? <laughs> he's, he's basically, this guy's an empty talker. He's a prophet of theirs, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. So this empty talker is a racist and a bigot, uh, which is slightly different than a racist in my opinion. Uh, Cretans are people from Crete. This is where you get the word, you Cretan. It's a slam. And he's saying, now, it's very interesting. you got to read this. Look what he says. Here's somebody misquoting uh, one, one says, a prophet of their own said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Evil beast. What does that mean, evil beast? Um, let's go back in history. 
to 18, well, let's go back even further than that, 1772, uh, the, uh, the Congress writing the Constitution in the United States. They said that blacks were not human. They were not men. They were half a man. And one of the hanging offenses of a black person would be if he married or had sex with a white person because he was a beast mixing with a human being. Awful. But this idea of they're evil beasts is these Cretans are not even human. They're just, they're just scary, evil things. That's racism. That's bigotry to the deepest level. We've experienced that in the United States. Uh, there are people that believe that today. I think he's comparing it to like a wild animal. Well, could be that. It could be that. Now, okay, wild animal. Saying, okay, they're, and the basis of that is they're not human. They're a wild animal. They're, th that's, uh, so, then he goes on and he says, this testimony is true. I gotta stop here. This testimony is true. Is he saying that the testimony of the guy that's saying Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons? No. What's the testimony is true? That's what they're saying. That's what, exactly. You see what I'm saying? You, so you got to be, you got to think. Because somebody could quote this verse and say, well, he's a Cretan. And we know what the Bible says Cretans are. It's right here. Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. And, and Paul says this testimony is true. So we have to be careful in our study not to pull stuff out. Remember, the text without context is a pretext. So you got to go with your context. So the, the testimony is true. For, th for this reason, because this testimony is true that they're saying, reprove them. And now you can go into a whole study about reproving. What does it mean? Now I want you to jump ahead. Um, the, on page 84. When the gold applies, does, does the gold apply, the bottom of page 84, you could, I've given you all these questions. By the way, I've given you the same questions and these same thought-provoking thought things for the whole book of First, Timothy, uh, First Titus. Whole book of Titus. First and last Titus, how's that? Uh, I've given you the questions. We're not going to do all the chapters. Um, I've just given you that to, so you can do on your own a study in Titus and you can use those uh, questions just to kind of give yourself uh, an idea of the questions to go with. Um, but one of the things on application to ask is does this apply to me right now or does this apply to me in the future? Or did this apply to me in the past? Um, if I'm talking about quick-tempered, uh, that is something that doesn't apply to me now, but did apply to me in the past that I need to be taken into praise and worship about. Um, is there a specific situation that this application would apply to? Maybe I have a specific thing at work with a specific person that this applies to. Maybe it's a more general. Uh, maybe it's more my family. Maybe it's a specific child in my family that I've that I have wronged that I need to go and apologize to, and say, "Dad's an idiot." Um, and they go, "Yeah." Um, then, to whom does the gold apply? Application. That it, does this apply to me, or does this apply to a child, or to my wife, or to my friend? or to somebody else that I don't know. Now, if it applies to them, I can't go running and say, boy, did I find a verse for you. I've got to internalize that into my life 
so that I can share it from the perspective of this is something God has shown me. And then pray that the Holy Spirit applies it. We're not the Holy Spirit. We shouldn't be taking verses and pounding people with a verse. This is for you. Boom. The only time I really try to do that is, is a verse of encouragement. Um, so does it apply to me? Does it apply to someone I know? At the very bottom of page 84, can you help them by sharing your gold? Now, if I'm going into a Bible study with a group or even with a person, Darnell, what's in the back of my mind is I'm not going to teach the Scripture in order to impress him about how much I know about the Scripture. I want to teach from the perspective of, does my sharing this, does my teaching this impact him? It isn't about me. It's about God. It's about me being the apostle and Christ sending me with a message for him, for the Holy Spirit to use in his life. It's not about me being the big teacher. It's not about me knowing what I know. It's about me sharing what the Holy Spirit can use in a person's life. That's sharing. That's taking the treasure and not saying, this is my treasure. I'll, I'll tell you about my treasure if, if you're impressed with the fact that it's mine. Okay? And we know teachers that teach that way. It's all about, I'm teaching so that you understand how smart I am or how much I know. And I'm giving you a little glimpse of all the beautiful things in my brain. No. Christian teaching should be sharing from the heart to the heart and let the Holy Spirit take it. Okay? That's sharing the gold. That's sharing the treasure. Continue to share your wealth. Back to page 85, and we're going to get to the assignment here. Uh, share, continue to share your wealth. Continue to do that. That is such a blessing to find something in Scripture, have God impact you, and share it to somebody and see God impact them through you sharing it. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge blessing. Um, now, you can share your gold on the top of page 85. Share your gold to help untrained miners. I might meet with a person that has never studied the Scriptures before, and me sharing what I've discovered from the Scripture encourages him to be a miner, to dig, to learn how to, to do a Bible study. It also is a witness to skeptical non-miners. Uh, a non-Christian has no concept that the Bible can speak to him, that the Bible speaks to your life, that the Bible's got anything to say about anything in 2017. And so sharing something, not preaching, not trying to win an argument, but sharing, boy, I used to be so mad about things like you are. And I tell you, God really took that and quieted that down because of my relationship with Christ. Uh, and so you can be a witness to skeptical non-minors by showing them something in the Scripture. I've had guys say, I, no, the Bible doesn't ever say anything to me about it. I can't understand anything in the Bible. And so I turn to Romans 3.23, and I underline it. It's underlined already in my Bible, but I underline it if, if we got a blank Bible. Underline it, I say, okay, read that verse that I've underlined. What does it say? All of sin and fall short of the glory of God. What does that mean? Everybody sinned? Hey, you're, you're an expert Bible student. Look at that. But how about this one? Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. What does that say? Well, okay. Great. How about this verse? Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace you've been saved through faith. Not, you know, you can help a non-believing skeptic see that he can understand things in the Scripture. As long as he doesn't start in Numbers. Or Leviticus or something. Okay, now... <laughs> Your, your, your assignment for, for the future is continue to do your study in Titus. I've given you those sheets. I've given you every page of Titus in my, in my Bible, including the notes at the end about uh, the Trinity that I showed you. I've given you the whole book of Titus that's marked, and I've given you all the kind of questions that you could do. So do that on your own. That'd be, uh, be fun. 
Next week, we're going to talk about how to build a, a mine system of once you have all these shafts and they're marked in your treasure map, that's great. But now you're going to get more information. So, for example, my treasure map might say there's treasure on this island. But if I have, how do I get to the island? Well, you need a ship. Okay, and I've got the specs of the ship. Well, that's not written on my treasure map. Where do I keep those specs so that I can find them? Tony delivered a great message on, on peace six months ago. You took notes in your bulletin. Where's the bulletin? Where are the notes? Can you refer to them again? Okay? I'm going to show you how to do that next week. I'm going to show you how to organize basically your own personal reference library and how to keep track of it so that you can use a reference library into the future. I have a reference library right now, a personal reference li library of over 10,000 documents. And I'm going to show you how I organize them, I show you how I use them, I show you how you could start to do that next week, okay? Can't wait? Okay. <laughs> uh, let's, let's pray. Uh, Father, I praise you and thank you for this time. It's been a great time. It's great folks here. I pray that the Holy Spirit would bring things to remembrance as they're thinking through this class, as they're reviewing what they've learned, as they're in Titus, that you would speak to them uh, way better than I have and that you would speak into their hearts uh, way better than I'm able. And Father, we, we pray that you would help us uh, look for opportunities to share our, our nuggets, our, our treasure with other people to be an encouragement into their lives. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.